What do I do for community and fellowship? Have you ever had that conversation? On the early stages of getting out. How, what, what do we do to, to fellowship with people? I can't, I hear this, I can't find a meeting that's right for me. Uh, I was with group X, Y, and Z, but I didn't agree with what they were teaching. Uh, all those sort of questions about what do I do now that I'm no longer part of an organized structure. I have a friend of mine has coined this phrase. It's not totally satisfying, but I like it. He said, we meet regularly, but not routinely. So sometimes when people uh, kind of throw the, uh, that, that canard at me, well, you know, what are you doing for fellowship? I say, well, we meet regularly, just not routinely. Well, what does that mean? And then it opens up a conversation. It is also not about finding a meeting form that is perfect for you in the sense that you just agree with everything. It's all about being assigned to people by the Holy Spirit. When it came to the twelve, the Lord Jesus prayed all night for those. And at the end of his life, he said, I have kept all those that you gave me except the one. The, the prophet uh, in Isaiah, I think it's 18, says, Myself and the children you have given me are for signs and wonders in the earth. I think we're asking the wrong question when we ask the question, well, what kind of meeting should I go to? What group can I join? Hey, do you have an organic home group meeting that I should come to? I think it's the wrong question. The question is that we should ask is who are you assigned to? And I want to give you two metaphors. Imagine a, a, a young a health, and, and this is a a sexual metaphor, don't, don't take it inappropriately, don't, don't read into any uh, gratuitousness, it's just a natural metaphor. Uh, imagine a young, young man, he's normal, his hormones are on overdrive, and he's insecure, and he wants to get him a woman. And this town has like a weekly country dance for young people, and they have a, a dance hall, and, but he's so insecure, and every time he's ever tried to have a relationship with a woman, he's always got dumped, and so he's swearing off of women. What are the chances of that man getting a date? Zero. Zero. The reason why, he's letting his past experience dampen his spirit for relational adventure, if I can put it that way. Don't let what's happened to you in the past keep you out of the dance hall work the metaphor with me. So let's say he gets over his insecurity, he goes to the dance hall, and you know, and he's shuffling around, and he finally gets enough nerve to ask a young lady to dance with him. Again, keep it in the, an appropriate route. And the young lady says no. He goes, yeah, same old thing, just like the last one. He huffs and he puffs, and he walks out of there. I'm never going to a dance again. What's the chances of that guy getting a date? Zero. Not very much. Zero. Minus one. Minus one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the, the same guy goes to date, and he, he, get, he overcomes his insecurity, and he actually asks a couple of ladies to dance with him, and, and it, it goes okay. But kind of nothing, nothing sparks, you know? But then... That young man dances with a woman and there's something different. Now anybody watching them could tell that something is different. He danced with those three, but he's dancing with that one. And that dance leads to another dance, which leads to another dance, which leads to another date, which leads to a proposal which leads to a marriage, which leads to a family. The moral of the story is, there's no harm in the dance because you're not called to make babies with everybody. Work the metaphor. 
Organic church, de church people are so afraid of the dance hall that they won't make the investment to see if you're assigned to anybody to bring forth fruitfulness. There's nothing wrong with meetings. A meeting, you know what a meeting is? It's just an opportunity for the potentiality of relationship. And that's why I don't get the anti-meeting reactionariness in organic church circles. I get reacting against the values, but it's just the dance hall. Not everybody you're going to come to are you going to take on a date. Not everybody you're going to have a family with. But the one that you do have a family with, you're going to, everything's going to change for you. When it comes to community, guys, we have to be relationally adventuresome and be ready to be disappointed. Just like a young man asking several ladies to dance. Some are going to say no. Some are going to say yes, and there might be one that has a future. Part of being assignable by the Holy Spirit is to be willing to go to an environment where you might experience some negative things. Let me give you an example. I, I am positive that Daniel did not appreciate being castrated and sent to Babylon. Guaranteed that he didn't agree with the doctrine. Uh, by the way, where I get that, King James says uh, Chamberlain. Yeah. You know, he's, King James sanitized it. You know what they did in those days? Yeah. They took the best, when you were an invading army, you took the best, not the peasants, you took the best and the brightest, took them out of their venue, emasculated them and put them in with the eunuchs because you didn't want them reproducing. So Daniel, you, again, when people think they've had a rough life, and God had, da Daniel didn't have to ever worry about having children because he didn't have the apparatus. And yet it didn't embitter him. And my point is, he prospered in an environment he would have never chose for himself. We, again, if we are supposedly spiritually progressive people, we have to be assignable by God. The question isn't what's the right meeting and what's the wrong meeting. That's the wrong kind of dance and that's the right kind of dance. The, the issue is, are you assignable? Now, you don't have to go to Babylon. But God has to have the right to send you to Babylon. It has to be on your spiritual radar screen. Because the way the Spirit of the Lord put it to me one time was, are you willing for me to spend you for somebody else's benefit? We've got to grow up in some things. It's not about whether I like to preach it. It's not about whether I like the worship service. It's not about whether they have ministry for the kids. The question is, has God assigned you to each other? Guys, I am convinced that everything hinges on that. Go back to the, the dance analogy. Let's, let's say all right, you're, um, you're, 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 you're an older you're the chaperone of the dance, and you're watching everybody, and you see that one time when... He dances with the one. And, the and you look at the other chaperone and you go, what does that, what does that mean? It's working. it's working. I call it this, relational lines of attraction. Otherwise, not that one. Not that one. That one. There's something there that makes this happen. Jesus did, didn't, did not pick just 12 clowns out of the crowd. Who have you given to me? I haven't had a chance to do this recently because I don't roll in those circuits much anymore. But sometimes if, if I'm in a room full of pastor and preacher types, I like to say, um, the Lord spent all night praying about those that he was given permission to shape their lives. How many of you have prayed about if the people in front of you this Sunday have even been given to you by God? So far, nobody's hand goes up. And I say, how come we operated a motif that the second person of the Godhead didn't even operate under? It's one thing, again, Rob's earlier question, to preach the gospel to every living thing. But Sam said something earlier. You don't make babies with everybody and you don't discipline another man's children. We assume because somebody shows up that they've been given to me to conform and transform. That is not the case. It is possible that I could be trying to conform and discipline another man's 
children metaphorically. And then we wonder why none of it works, because we haven't done the basic thing. We haven't even asked each other, have we been given to each other? We can have love and goodwill and fun and everything, but in the sense of the full dynamic of the kingdom and, and a, a spiritual reality that's vibrant and bring forth new life, we have to know, I have been assigned to you. Because, guys, when we ask that question and get it answers, that changes the dialogue. Now it's no longer, I don't like the worship service, I don't like so-and-so, it's all about for what purpose have we been brought together? I think every Christian community needs to have that conversation. And it doesn't mean that there can't be people on the perimeter. And it doesn't mean there can't be people coming in, kind of sniffing things out, just sticking their head in the dance hall and deciding whether they want to dance here or not. That's okay. But the magic happens when the relational lines of attraction are there and you know it. That's when the kingdom of God and all this good stuff that we want to see happen, happens. And it's fair to ask that, because it was either Rob or uh, Samuel said earlier too, or Vince, work the sexual metaphor with me, but not to the point of impropriety. You don't just give your seed to everybody, do you? Right? Because there's a specific one I've been assigned to, to be fruitful. And it's the same thing in the spirit. I can be a good friend, good brother, minister, da-da-da-da-da, to anybody. But not everybody have I been called to, to partner with in that way. So when it comes to community and fellowship, what's community? I'm, I'm trying to build something. What if everybody was asking that question? And what if in community, Samuel understood that by divine assignment, and Rob understood, come hell or high water, They've been assigned to each other. There, please listen to me. There will be power. There will be grace. There will be the kingdom. And then what if, they, and what if Vince discovers that he's assigned? Man, I'm talking cosmic energy. But then what if, if Rita and Lynn and Stephanie discover they're assigned? And they don't even know if those three guys are together. But Rita and Stephanie and Lynn, they, they, they've, done, they've danced. Some bam. And so, in the sense of, well, do I have to attend a meeting? No, I don't have to attend a meeting. I need to give myself to the assignment. And then what? When you have that group going, that group going, they discover each other, what do you do? Have a meeting. Because why? We cannot stand being apart from each other. It is a mistake to think a meeting will produce life. A meeting needs to be the necessary overflow of abundant passion for each other that can't be contained any other way. When people start asking me, when they, they say, well, Steve, what, what, what group should I attend? You know, uh, should I go to the organic church? Should I go to the Wolfgang Simpson group? Should I go to the Frank Viola group? I say, none of the above. You're still asking the wrong questions. Ask the Lord, rather than saying, Lord, where should I go? Where should I attend? What meeting should I go to? Ask this question. Lord, lead me to hungry hearts, one person at a time. When I find that hungry heart, listen to these three things. Invite them to your table. Who's going to say no to a free meal? There, excuse me, very few people. Slowly invite them into your heart, and in so doing, you'll establish safety with each other, and you will discover, is this one of those assignments or not? If it's not, you've wasted nothing, you've just had a good meal. And then, if there's life and love present, have a meeting. Man! I just met this really cool person at work. Her name's Lily Rosser. Have you ever met her? No, I've never met her. Man, I had dinner at her house the other day. Her and her, and her husband, they're really cool people. Would you, we're, I'm going there next week. Would you like to come? Yeah, I'd like to come, I guess. That person comes, and what, what do you now have? You have a meeting. Birth out of hungry hearts. 
birthed out of understanding relational assignment. And here's the other one that I want you to get. Make life and love demand a meeting. Don't expect a meeting to produce life and love. A meeting is just the dance hall for the potential of relationship. I would like to go on on the limb today and say, I believe that if everyone in this room did what I'm saying, we would have more kingdom, more fellowship, more relationship than we could ever handle. But you know why we don't do it? Because it's slow and it's costly. It is just easier to go to a meeting where I have low investment and somebody's going to preach to me. Because I do my thing, maybe if I'm charismatic, I get my Jesus buzz and I go home. But, but, but for you, to, but for me, how, we are dealing in a gospel fatigue world, is that true? In a gospel fatigue culture, particularly around here. It's everywhere. How many of you discovered that folks, generally speaking, don't care? Not interested, don't want to hear about your Jesus talk. But you know what folks do respond to? Somebody who takes an interest in them. Somebody who listens to them, their story, their pain. Will you do that over a meal? It's such a, it's such a low threat, reachable thing. But you're not going to build a mega church that way. But you're going to define who, who you're assigned to. And let's say you do it, and let's say nothing happens. That's being relationally missional. You've tried, and, and it, it doesn't mean you're bad, and it's liberating. You're not wrong, they're not wrong. It's just a dance. It's just innocent. You met each other in Jesus, maybe. You had a nice dinner, and that's it. But what if? What if there's that one Everything changes. Is anybody understanding what I'm talking about? It, it, everything changes from that. Your life will change one divine assignment at a time. In my opinion, I think we've been doing this backward for all these years. Because we have made, and I'm jumping into the evangelism class a little bit here, session, inviting people to the meeting, the beginning and the end of everything. The meeting should be the last thing. You don't invite them to a meeting, you invite them to your family. You invite them into your heart. Anybody can discharge somebody at the door of a building. It's another thing to invite them into your heart. That's why we have to have divine assignment. How many of you have discovered that people can be a load? I, you know, I saw this article about, uh, you know, a, a, a fundamentalist Mormon polygamist. I'm, I'm thinking he's out of his mind, he wants to have six women. You know, one, one, one's, one, one, one's enough. One's enough. <laughs> dear, dear, it's because you're so special. <laughs> pull, what, what's that uh, B move? Pull up, pull up, pull up. Yeah. yeah. It's a mistake to come out of the institutional construct and still have a meeting-centric mind. That's what I'm trying to give to you on this session about, about covenant and community and fellowship. If we are stuck in meeting-centricity, we still haven't got it. Because it's not about meetings. It's about human beings. It's about you and I and Christ together. And from the overflow, let that develop into a meeting. I like to put it this way, that, our, that we cannot stand being apart from each other. Take it to the next level. If we really believe that Christ was in each of us, and if we really believe that Lauren has a portion for me that I can't live with, I would not want to, do you, do you know where I'm going? Otherwise, my, my bond with Lauren is not an accessory that I do after I fulfilled my American dream and I give Jesus the 2% scraps of what's left over after I've done everything else. My brother, my sister, has my portion. This is basic Christianity, folks. We just don't believe it. Because as long as you and I are extraneous baggage to another pursuit called chasing the American dream 
Guys, we will never touch anything we've talked about today. You and I have to be essential to one another. Now, how we meet, when we meet, what we do when we meet, that is as wide as the universe. It's not as narrow as we have made it out to be. Everyone talks a big game about relationship, but few will make the priority and the effort necessary. You guys are to be commended to coming to this weekend, not just for my ego's sake, but you know the truth of it is, guys? You will invest in what matters to you. I had almost 40 people registered for this seminar. Some other folks made other value decisions. It's not a judgment, it's reality. You make value decisions for what you do with your time and your money. Please listen to me. Your time and your money tell me what you believe, not your opinions about the Bible. Your time and your money tell me what you really believe. Because in our culture, what are the two most precious commodities? Yeah, time and money, which are virtually interchangeable. The kingdom of God will never be realized on the scraps, leftovers, and margins that you have after you've fulfilled your other life desires pursuing the American dream. I, I've listened to so many D church people whine about community, but you know what they want? They want the church that they like, on the time that they want, was convenient for what they want, with as little, little cost as they want. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's really a bit off-putting to listen to a 50-year-old whine about no, the lack of community while their entire life infrastructure is filled with American cultural values. It, it just, that, guys, that's not even mental health. That, that is a mental disorder. Because you're going to have to look at that person and tell them, so-and-so, brother, sister, no. No. You're never going to get it. Jesus is not an add-on. He's not a commodity that you tack on after you've, you've, you've finished this, pursuing this. He's either numero uno or he's not. Doesn't mean we don't get to enjoy the bandwidth of the joys of life, but it's come on. Get, you, we will give ourselves to what's important. Is that right? Everybody in this room, you will give your time, your talent, your treasure to what's important to you. You'll do it. We need to ask the right questions of our Father on this issue about community. I believe finding six people, I'll drop it down, three people who really love me is worth going to the dance. Let alone being challenged to serve sacrificially people that don't, not going to give me anything back. Maybe even in a system I don't approve of. I'm not saying you have to go there. I'm not say, and I'm saying you're free not to go there unless the Holy Spirit assigns you. If the Holy Spirit assigns you, you need to click your heels, do a yes sir, snap to attention, and away you. But I can't stand that place. I can't stand what they preach. The point, you're not there for what they preach. Are you hearing me? When you, if you get that kind of assignment, your, your spiritual radar is supposed to be up. Who, who am I here for? Here's another way of phrasing it, and I found this to be very helpful for people. I've used it. Here's a primal question you need to ask. And if God doesn't give me something else right now, this is going to be the last, and I want to go on to Rob's question from the other session. Father, I hope some of you are writing this down, or you get it from the video when you're done. Number one, Father, to whom have you assigned me at this season of life for their benefit and mine. Answer that question, that threefold question, and where you find your fellowship will be answered. Let's break it down. Who is the person? All right? It's the dance off. In this season, you know what this season means? You're not assigned for life. That's where the dance hall analogy breaks out. You're free to come and free to go. Do you, do you understand that sometimes we might be good for somebody for a period of time, then we're not good for each other? It's all right. Maybe somebody sees it and, and, and who I am and what I bring to the table is not... You know we're free. I like to say this. You ever see the old uh, 
Western movies, the door to the saloon. What, what's, what kind of door do they have on the saloon? Swing it. What does that mean? Easy in, easy out. Part of the old construct that has to go is this mentality that if you belong to some, it has to be 110%. No, my heart has to have a saloon door on it. Easy come, easy go. What season, Father, have we? It might be a short season or a long season. And the last one in that little triad, for their benefit and mine. Because that establishes mutuality. Nobody's superior. Nobody has more. They're going to contribute something to me. I'm going to contribute something to them. And guys, I'm thinking if we answer those three things, we will have a very satisfied, fruitful life. But the nature of treasure is that it is difficult to find. Give me some definitions of treasure, just off the top of your head. Treasure, what is treasure? And I've already given you part of the answer. Well, if treasure was easy to find, it wouldn't be treasure. What I'm talking about here is going to take some courage. Because I'm going to have to dig through a lot of sand and a lot of disappointment and a lot of disillusionment. But what happens when you hear the shovel go clink? It, listen now. If you don't believe in the inherent value of the treasure, you will not have the emotional energy for the process. You won't give yourself to it. It becomes a faith thing. I have to believe. And this is a good segue into some of Rob's questions yesterday about cynicism. Chronic disappointment. Chronic disillusionment. Uh, I'm going to give three or four suggestions that I, I had to deal with and I'd really like to open up for discussion to hear some of, some of your answers to that question. Number one. I, it's a faith posture. I have to believe there's treasure because I won't dig without it. I will stay home. Number two, and this is no order of priority. The book of Hebrews was written, as I said earlier, to a disenfranchised, disillusioned people who were thinking back of reverting to Judaism because it hasn't panned out. The answer for disillusionment is an accurate unveiling of Jesus. I see him again afresh. The author of the book of Hebrews basically spends the whole book trying to make the excellency of Jesus Christ just overwhelming, to, to persuade these people that even though it's disillusioning, it's still worth giving yourself to. So that, that's, that's another uh, remedy for uh, cynicism. Number three, uh, and you guys all know this, I have got to, in the middle of my cynicism, learn to give myself away to others. Because in the giving away of my virtue to others, God will take care of filling my, my vessel. Uh, sometimes uh, I, I listen to um, narcissistic charismatics carry on. You know what I feel like telling them about how hard it is, how hard life is? You need to go visit a cancer ward. You need to go to, go to St. Jude's. You need to go volunteer at the Alzheimer's home. Well, you know, it's so, so hard. Nobody likes it. Stop. You know, if you were two years old in the Lord, that'd be appropriate. So here's how, you know, somebody 35 years in the Lord carrying on about how hard this new way is. No, if I give myself away, it recontextualizes things. And I can feel my, 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 my love start to flow. Number four. Um, I wish I could prescribe what I'm about to say. I can't. For Rita and I, we can count on our lives in our hands right now maybe four leadership couples that have generally, genuinely loved us in 41 years. That's not a very impressive statistic. But when you find the real one, you don't remember the sand anymore. And Reed and I can testify when we moved here in 2010, we were done. And I said to Don Atkin, I said, Don, I have had my intestines pulled out and walked on for the last time. I've got nothing left to live, nothing left to give. And if this is not the real deal, I am done. 
I can't take the pain anymore. We can't take the pain anymore. And it's like, to Rob's question earlier, this looks good, but is, when's the other shoe gonna drop? Because I know when the other shoe drops, this is gonna turn to you know what, just like every other thing's ever turned to you know what. You know what prevents the other shoe from dropping? Is finding genuine love. By the grace of God, somebody will love me. Love changes everything. Love renews hope. And in, and in Don and a couple of others, we actually discovered, you know, not everybody has an agenda for my harm. Somebody might actually care for me. All right, shorter session. Questions or comments? For additional books, materials, and resources, including Kindle, EPUB, and PDF files, please go to stevecrosby.com. For free articles, MP3s, and resources, go to stevecrosby.org.